Lesson 13 for March 20 to 26, Rebirth of Planet Earth, read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, March 20. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the messages that have come already in the last 12 weeks from the book of Isaiah. And as we open your word today, as we look to the future, as we look to the new heavens and the new earth that you are to create, we just thank you for that. But above all, we thank you for the sacrifice made by Jesus that each of us could have access to eternal life. Bless us now as we open your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. Let's read that again. Isaiah 65, verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. One day, a twelve-year-old boy, having just read a book on astronomy, refused to go to school. His mother took the child to the family doctor, who asked, Billy, what's the matter? Why don't you want to study or go to school any more? Because, doctor, he said, I read in this astronomy book that one day the sun is going to burn out and all life on earth will vanish. I don't see any reason to do anything if, in the end, everything will die out. The mother, hysterical, shouted, It's not your business! It's not your business! The doctor smiled and said, But Billy, you don't need to worry, because by the time this happens, we'll all be long dead anyway. Of course, that's part of the problem. In the end, we're all dead anyway. Fortunately, our existence doesn't have to end in death. On the contrary, we have been offered life, eternal life, in a world made new. Sunday, March 21, New Heavens and a New Earth Question. Read Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 to 25. What kind of restoration does the Lord promise here? Isaiah 65, beginning at verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing, and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die one hundred years old, but the sinner being one hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree, so shall be the days of my people. And my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labour in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble. For they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and while they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. God promises a new creation, beginning with the words, For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Isaiah 65, 17. In this remarkable prophecy, the Lord promises to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight in verse 18. In the city there will be no more weeping in verse 19. People normally will live considerably longer than a century before they die, as we read in verse 20. 
Their work and children will remain for them to enjoy, as we read in verses 21 to 23. God will answer them even before they call, verse 24. Nice as it is, why is it not a picture of our final restoration, our final hope? Thus far, we have a picture of tranquil, long lives in the promised land. But even though people live longer, they still die. Where is the radical transformation of nature we expect with the creation of new heavens and a new earth? The next verse tells us, in verse 25, The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Verse 25. For carnivores, such as lions, to become vegetarian requires far more than a vegetarian cooking class. It requires a recreation to restore the world to its ideal state, as it was before sin in Eden introduced death. Here, in Isaiah 65, God presents the creation of new heavens and a new earth as a process, a series of steps that begins with the recreation of Jerusalem. Compare Isaiah 11, where the Messiah would bring justice. Isaiah 11, beginning at verse 1. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. Then, eventually, there will be peace on God's worldwide holy mountain. The imagery used in Isaiah 11 is similar to what's found in Isaiah 65. The wolf shall live with the lamb, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. That's chapter 11, verses 6 and 7. Although the Lord's holy mountain would begin with Mount Zion at Jerusalem, it was only a precursor, a symbol of what God promises to do, ultimately, in a new world with his redeemed people. And so to finish the day, suppose instead of living 60, 70, 90, or even a 100 years, most people lived a million years or more, why still would the fundamental problem of humanity not be solved? Why is eternal life the only answer to our deepest human needs? Monday, March 22, Divine Magnet Question. Read Isaiah 66, 1-19, keeping in mind the time in which Isaiah wrote, what is the basic message he is giving here? Isaiah 66, beginning at verse 1. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you have built me, and where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand was made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. He who kills a bull is as if he slays a man, he who sacrifices a lamb as if he breaks a dog's neck. He who offers a grain offering as if he offers swine's blood. He who burns incense as if he blesses an idol. Just as they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delights in their abominations, so will I choose their delusions, and bring their fears on them. Because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not hear. 
but they did evil before my eyes, and chose that in which I do not delight. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word, your brethren who hated you, who cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified, that we may see your joy, but they shall be ashamed. The sound of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, the voice of the Lord who fully repays his enemies. Before she was in labour, she gave birth. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labour, she gave birth to her children. Shall I bring to the time of birth and not cause delivery, says the Lord? Shall I, who cause delivery, shut up the womb, says your God? Rejoice with Jerusalem, and be glad with her, all you who love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all you who mourn for her, that you may feed and be satisfied with the consolation of her bosom, that you may drink deeply and be delighted with the abundance of her glory." For thus says the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Then you shall feed, on her side shall you be carried, and be dandled on her knees, as one whom your mother comforts. So I will comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. When you see this, your heart shall rejoice, and your bones shall flourish like grass. The hand of the Lord shall be known to his servants, and his indignation to his enemies. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind, to render his anger with fury, and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword the Lord will judge all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. Those who sanctify themselves and purify themselves to go to the gardens after an idol in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse, shall be consumed together, says the Lord. For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall be that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them, and those among them who escape I will send to the nations, to Tarshish and Pul and Lud, who draw the bow, and Tubal and Javan to the coastland afar off, who have not heard my fame, nor seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. Through the prophet, God reiterates the appeal and warning that permeates the book. God will save and restore the humble who tremble at his word in verses 2 and 5. As in Isaiah 40 verse 1, he will comfort them in verse 13, but he will destroy those who rebel against him. These include hypocrites of ritual, whose sacrifices he rejects in verses 3 and 4. As will compare also with Isaiah 1, 10 to 15. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. As well as those who hate and reject his faithful ones, as we saw in verse 5. They also include those who practice pagan abominations in verse 17 such as those practised at the temple in Jerusalem, as we read about in Ezekiel chapter 8, 7 to 12. So he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, there was a hole in the wall. Then he said to me, Son of man, dig into the wall. And when I dug into the wall, there was a door. 
And he said to me, Go in and seek the wicked abominations which they are doing there. So I went in and saw, and there every sort of creeping thing, abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed all around on the walls. And there stood before them seventy men of the elders of the house of Israel, and in their midst stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan. Each man had a censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the room of his idols? For they say, The Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. Question. Look in Isaiah 66, verse 3. What is this text saying? What spiritual principles are being revealed here? How might the same idea be expressed but in the context of contemporary Christianity and worship? Isaiah 66 verse 3 He who kills a bull is as if he slays a man. He who sacrifices a lamb as if he breaks a dog's neck. He who offers a grain offering as if he offers swine's blood. He who burns incense as if he blesses an idol, just as they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delights in their abominations. Question. How does God serve as a magnet to draw the nations to himself? Isaiah 66 verses 18 and 19 For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall be that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them, and those among them who escape I will send to the nations, to Tarshish and Pul and Lud, who draw the bow, and Tubal and Javan, to the coastlands afar off, who have not heard my fame nor seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. Following the destruction of his enemies in verses 14 to 17, God reveals his glory so that he becomes a magnet to draw people to Jerusalem, as we compare Isaiah 2, 2 to 4. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. He sets a sign among them, which is not specified here, but apparently refers to the sign last mentioned by Isaiah. God gives his people joy and peace and restores their land, as we read in Isaiah fifty-five twelve to 13 For you shall go out with joy and be led with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. When he reveals his glory by restoring his people after destruction, this is a sign of his restored favour, just as he gave Noah the sign of the rainbow after the flood, as we read in Genesis 9, 13-17. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. The water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. And so to finish the day, read Isaiah 66 and verse 5. What does it mean to tremble at his word? 
Why does the Lord want us to tremble at his word? If you don't tremble, what might that say about the condition of your heart? Isaiah 66 and verse 5. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Your brethren who hated you, who cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified, that we may see your joy. But they shall be ashamed. Tuesday, March 23. Missionaries and Worship Leaders Question. What is the meaning of survivors bringing people from the nations as an offering to the Lord? Isaiah 66, verses 19 and 20. I will set a sign among them, and those among them who escape I will send to the nations, to Tarshish and Pul and Lud, who draw the bow, and Tubal and Javan, to the coastlands afar off, who are not who have not heard my fame, nor seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. Then they shall bring all your brethren for an offering to the Lord out of all nations, on horses, and in chariots, and in litters, on mules, and on camels, to my holy mountain Jerusalem, says the Lord. As the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord, and I will also take some of them for priests and Levites, says the Lord. God sends survivors of his destruction out to the ends of the earth to people who do not know about God, and they shall declare my glory among the nations, it said in verse 19. This is one of the clearest Old Testament statements on the theme of missionary outreach. In other words, not only are people to be drawn to the Hebrew nation, but also some of the Hebrew people will go to other nations and teach them about the true God, a paradigm that is explicit in the New Testament. Though there was Jewish missionary outreach between the time of return from exile and the time of Christ, the early Christians spread the gospel rapidly and on a massive scale. Matthew 23, verse 15, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. And Colossians 1, 23, If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Just as the Israelites brought grain offerings to the Lord at his temple, so the missionaries would bring an offering to him. But their offering would be all your kindred from all the nations, verse 20. Just as grain offerings were gifts to God that were not slaughtered, the converts brought to the Lord would be presented to him as living sacrifices. Reminds us of Romans 12.1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. For the idea that people could be presented as a kind of offering to God Note the much earlier dedication of Levites in Numbers 8.11 as an elevation offering from the Israelites that they may do the service of the Lord. Question. What is the significance of God's promise to take some of them as priests and Levites, as it said in Isaiah 66.21, and I will also make some of them for priests and Levites, says the Lord. The them in verse 21 refers to your kindred from all the nations in the previous verse. These are Gentiles, some of whom God would choose as worship leaders, along with the priests and the Levites. This is a revolutionary change. God previously had authorised only descendants of Aaron to serve as priests, and only other members of the tribe of Levi to assist them. Gentiles could not literally become descendants of Aaron or Levi, but God would authorise some to serve in these capacities. 
which had previously been forbidden even to most Jews. And so to finish today, read 1 Peter 2 verses 9 and 10. To whom is Peter writing? What is he saying? What message does he have for each of us as members of a holy nation today? Are we doing any better than the original people? Let's look at 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And Exodus 19, verse 6. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Wednesday, March 24, Community of Faith The Israelites were a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. Exodus 19 verse 6 reads, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel, with special priests set apart to represent them as worship leaders. But in the future, some Gentiles would become worship leaders, as we read in Isaiah 66.21, And I will also take some of them for priests and Levites, says the Lord. Question, how would this change affect the renewed community of faith? Well, first of all, we'll look at Matthew 28.19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And Acts 26, verse 20, But declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. And Galatians 3, 28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Colossians 3.11 Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. And 1 Timothy 3.16 And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. In God's new world order, Gentiles would not only join God's people, but they also would be equal partners with Jews in a combined community of faith that would be a royal priesthood. Therefore, the distinction between Jews and Gentiles would become functionally irrelevant. Question, when was this prophecy of Isaiah fulfilled? Paul, the missionary to the Gentiles, proclaimed in Galatians 3.28 and 29, There is no longer Jew or Greek, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Becoming heirs of the promise, and therefore an exalted royal priesthood, was not a mandate for smug elitism, but a commission to join the Jews in proclaiming, as it says in 1 Peter 2.9, the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. As it says in Isaiah 66.19, I will set a sign among them, and those among them who escape I will send to the nations, to Tarshish and Pul and Lud, who draw the bow, and Tubal and Javan, to the coastland afar off, who have not heard my fame nor seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. 
the elevation of Gentiles did not entitle Jews to grumble that God was unfair in giving them the same reward, nor did it entitle Gentiles to treat their Jewish brothers and sisters with disrespect, any more than workers hired later in the day should look down on those hired earlier, as we read in Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire labourers for his vineyard. Now, when he had agreed with the labourers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You also go into the vineyard and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the labourers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first, and the first last. For many are called, but few chosen. The Jews had first been entrusted with the oracles of God, as it says in Romans 3, 2, as God's channel of revelation. Paul wrote to the Gentiles, in Romans eleven seventeen and 18, But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, a wild olive shoot, were grafted in their place, to share the rich root of the olive tree, do not boast over the branches. So to finish today, in light of the cross, in light of the Gospel Commission, why is any kind of spiritual or ethnic or even political elitism so abhorrent in the sight of God? Look closely at yourself. Are you harbouring any sense of spiritual or ethnic superiority? If so, repent. Thursday, March 25. So shall your seed and your name remain. Question. Read Isaiah 66, verse 22. What is the text saying to us? What hope can we find there? Isaiah 66, verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. One of the most wonderful promises in Isaiah is found in this verse, Isaiah 66, 22. Read it carefully. In the new heavens and the new earth, our seed and our name shall remain forever. No more blotting out, cutting off, grafting in, plucking up or uprooting. We have here a promise of eternal life in a world made new, a world without sin, without death, without suffering, a new heaven and a new earth the final and complete fulfilment of our Christian faith, the consummation of what Christ had accomplished for us at the cross. Question, why are there new moons along with Sabbaths in the depiction of the new heavens and the new earth as presented in Isaiah 66 verse 23? And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. 
Though there are a number of different ways to look at this difficult text, one approach is this. God created the Sabbath before the sacrificial system existed, Genesis 2, verses 2 to 3, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. So, although Sabbaths were honoured by the ritual system, they are not dependent upon it. Thus, they continue uninterrupted throughout the restoration period on into the new earth. There is no indication in the Bible that new moons were legitimate days of worship apart from the sacrificial system. But perhaps they will be worship days. But not necessarily rest days like weekly Sabbaths in the new earth possibly in connection with the monthly cycle of the tree of life, as you read in Revelation 22 and verse 2. In the middle of its street, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits. Each tree yielding its fruit every month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Whatever the specific meaning of Isaiah 66 to 23 may be, the critical point seems to be that God's people will be worshipping him throughout eternity. Question. Why does Isaiah end with the negative picture of saved people looking at the corpses of rebels destroyed by God? In Isaiah 66, 24. And they shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, for their worm does not die, and their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. As a graphic warning to the people of his day, Isaiah encapsulates the contrast between faithful survivors of the Babylonian destruction and rebels who would be destroyed. This is not everlasting torment. The rebels are dead, killed by fire, a destruction that was not quenched until it did its job, so that the recreation of Jerusalem could begin. Isaiah's warning points forward to an ultimate fulfilment prophesied by the book of Revelation, destruction of sinners, Satan, and death in a lake of fire, after which there will be a new heaven and a new earth, a holy new Jerusalem, and no more weeping or pain, for the first things have passed away, Revelation 21, verses 1 through to 4. And we'll compare that with Isaiah 65, 17 to 19. And that reads, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice for ever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing, and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. A new existence with eternal life for all who are redeemed from the earth. And let's just go back and look at Revelation chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years were finished. But after these things he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection." Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, when the thousand years were expired, Satan will be released from his prison, and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. 
They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil, who deceived them, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night for ever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And any one not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Friday, March 26. From the book The Great Controversy, page 678, we read, And the years of eternity, as they roll, will bring richer and still more glorious revelations of God and of Christ. As knowledge is progressive, so will love, reverence and happiness increase. The more men learn of God, the greater will be their admiration of his character. As Jesus opens before them the riches of redemption and the amazing achievements in the great controversy with Satan, the hearts of the ransomed thrill with more fervent devotion, and with more rapturous joy they sweep the harps of gold. And ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands of voices unite to swell the mighty chorus of praise. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing and honour and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb for ever and ever. Revelation 5.13 The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beat through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things, animate and inanimate, in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declare that God is love. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. 1. Why is the promise of eternal life in a new heaven and a new earth so basic to our Christian belief? What good would our faith be without that promise? And 2. Read Second Peter three ten to 14 How do these verses reflect the same idea presented in Isaiah 66? Second Peter 3, beginning at verse 10 But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in them will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot, and blameless. And so to summarise this week's lesson, Isaiah presents a vision of staggering scope. Not only would God purge and restore his community of faith, but he also would enlarge its borders to encompass all nations. Ultimately, the recreation of his community would lead to the recreation of planet Earth, where his presence would be the ultimate comfort of his people.
Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Tire Trouble, and it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. Ilya Koltok, a pastor and men's dean at Zaskowski Adventist University in Russia, climbed into the car with his wife to go on a Black Sea vacation. After about ten hours, the car started having tyre trouble. Pop, pop, pop. Ilya wasn't sure what was wrong. Pop, pop, pop. He stopped the car and got out. Standing over the tyres, he couldn't see any problem. He prayed with his wife. Dear God, we're having trouble with the tyres, he prayed. Please help us. Ilya slid behind the steering wheel and drove on. Pop, pop, pop. The noise grew louder and louder. Ilya and his wife had travelled 600 miles, that's about a 1,000 kilometres. They couldn't easily turn around and go home. They still had 250 miles or 400 kilometres to go until they reached their destination. Pop, pop, pop. Ilya prayed silently. Suddenly, he sensed a male voice say, Stop at that car repair shop and go to the mechanics inside. Startled, he looked out the window and saw a car repair shop. He stopped and found two men sitting and talking as if they didn't have any work to do. "'Can you help me?' Ilya said. "'My car is making noises.' The mechanics checked the car. They rotated the tyres. They did other things. "'Get in,' a mechanic said finally. "'You can go.' "'Thank you,' Ilya said. "'How much do I owe you?' Two hundred roubles,' he said. "'Or about three US dollars.' Ilya found two hundred roubles and a pocket-sized Gospel of John. He tucked the money in the book and handed it to the surprised mechanics. "'What is this?' a mechanic asked. "'The Gospel,' Ilya said. The mechanics grew more surprised. "'Are you a pastor?' one asked. Ilya nodded. The mechanics' faces lit up with joy. They took the two hundred roubles out of the book and returned it to Ilya. One of them held up the book. "'God sent this book to us,' he said. "'We were just talking about God.' when you arrived. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help construct the grade school and high school building on the campus of Azowski Adventist University in Russia. And there's a photograph on the left of the pastor, Pastor Ilya Koltok. I trust you've enjoyed this series of lessons on the book of Isaiah. It's been really thrilling to me to be able to read what God has promised And we see in the Gospels how it all came to be. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.